Thanks, Roger. And thanks to Morton and uh, Ruben for the invitation. So I'll be talking about the role of SLAM F7, CD38, and bispecifics in newly diagnosed myeloma. And these are my disclosures. So we've had a lot of drug approvals in myeloma, but not a single group, even the best risk group, has a flat overall survival curve. We're losing patients continually. And part of that has to do with the fact that there's attrition. So this slide shows that with each successive line of therapy, we have diminishing returns in terms of response rate and PFS. Not to mention, we have attrition. Not every patient who's newly diagnosed is able to get to the second and third line of therapy. This is particularly true for high-risk and frail elderly patients. Sometimes we get one good shot of treating these patients, and then if we're not able to capture that, we continually lose. So I think it's important to try to use efficacious regimens to achieve and sustain remissions. So let's move to the three drug categories. First is ELO, uh, the anti-CS1 monoclonal antibody, in combination with RVD. Um, Dr. Laubach presented this data in ASCO 2017. In the table, the first column, you can see RVD ELO. This was a phase two study. And after four cycles and 33 patients, there was a response rate of 82% and a pretty impressive VGPR and better rate of 55% and 15% CR stringent CR. To put that into context, this is from um, Dr. Voorhees' uh, ASCO discussion uh, summary. You have the three other studies, including the um, IFM 2009, the uh, Richardson initial phase two, and then also the uh, French, um, Dr. Kumar's evolution study. And so you can see with the RVD, when these other studies, you have a response rate ranging from 70 to 90%, but uh, lower VGPR compared to the addition of ELO, 11 to 45%, and CRs as shown. Unfortunately, um, that's, we don't have any additional follow-up data, and importantly for ELO, we know that it's not about the response, but the durability of response. Most of the ELO studies have shown significant improvement in PFS, so it'll be important to get follow-up data on this depth of response and how that translates into PFS benefit. There didn't appear to be any impact on stem cell mobilization, but some of the concerns that are raised by this phase two study, 18% of patients discontinued therapy within the first four cycles due to toxicity. In particular, there's a concerning infection signal that was seen in 50% of patients, including one death, one grade four sepsis, and four grade three pneumonias. And I don't think we completely understand the mechanism because we don't see these infections with ELO, LEN, ELO, POM. And I, I just throw out the hypothesis, could this be an effect of combining ELO with proteasome inhibitors? Um, in this table from Jakubowiak's randomized phase uh, two study of ELO VD versus VD, we see that any grade infection was 67% in the triplet versus 53%, and grade three, four infections were 21% versus 13%. Clearly, we need more data, and uh, fortunately, we have three studies in progress. Um, the eloquent one for transplant ineligible patients, ELO RD versus RD, and then two uh, for transplant um, eligible patients, there's the German study, ELO uh, VRD versus without in induction, consolidation, and transplant, and also there's a SWOG study, phase one, two. Uh, but focusing on high-risk patients without transplant. So stay tuned for more data. Moving to CD38, where we have a, quite a bit more data, uh, starting with Alcyon, this was the phase three study comparing DARA plus minus, uh, the VMP plus minus DARA for transplant ineligible patients. Um, these were newly diagnosed, had to have a clearance greater than 40, and they got standard VMP, although importantly, the bortezomib was only given twice weekly for the first cycle, and thereafter it was given weekly, which I think is a more tolerable regimen for this transplant ineligible population. And then the DARA containing arm got DARA. Importantly, after the nine cycles uh, that were uh, six week duration, only the experimental arm gets continued therapy with DARA. And the primary endpoint was PFS. Importantly, the median age of this population is 71, and I think we'll come back to that because uh, the, the median age does differ in some of these uh, studies. More than 90% of these patients were over age 65, and 30% were actually over age 75, and about 16% were high risk. And we see that the efficacy was improved on the left, the response rate 91 versus 74%, more MRD negativity 27 versus 7%, improved PFS, um, this hazard ratio is 50, uh, 0.43, or 57% reduction in the risk of progression or death. And one of the other important things shown that we have, uh, but this was updated data from Demopolis, one of the questions people have is if we use novel agents in CD38 up front, how is this going to compromise later lines of therapy and subsequent relapses? 
And one way to get to that, obviously the best way to get to that is overall survival, but that's going to take longer follow-up. But based on some, the European guidelines where there's a PFS2 endpoint, which is essentially your first PFS combined with the second PFS, and you add those up to kind of account for might there be a deterioration in the next line of therapy, the PFS2 hazard ratio is still favoring the addition of DARA 0.59. When we look at uh, the pre-specified subgroup analysis, this is the forest plot showing pretty much across the board the superiority of the addition of daratumumab, including some renal dysfunction. Um, in, importantly, ISS3 did seem to favor also the addition of DARA. High risk, which is a recurring theme that we'll see in this um, presentation, the confidence interval does cross one, but the hazard ratio is still 0.78, favoring DARA. It's important to note that the number of patients here was only 53 and 45. So these are not powered to answer these uh, high-risk questions rigorously. And uh, I think that's one of the limitations of all the high-risk data. But high-risk patients did seem to benefit as well. In terms of safety, um, as shown here, generally comparable. Uh, the few things that we see is there is a higher rate of infections, 66.8% all grade versus 48%, uh, grade 3, 23, and, uh, versus 14.7. Typically, these come in the form of respiratory infections. Importantly, these are also not exposure adjusted. Um, these are just the raw because obviously patients getting DARA are going to be on therapy longer. There's also the Maya study. Obviously, we don't use a lot of Melphalan in the U.S., but this is DRD versus RD. Uh, here, the control arm does get continued treatment, so it's not a discontinuation like Alcyon. Transplant ineligible, median age of 73, but good performance status, creatinine clearance greater than 30, and approximately 15% were high risk, similar to Alcyon. The, in terms of the uh, primary endpoint is PFS, and disposition-wise, the rate of uh, discontinuation due to progression was higher in RD, 24 versus 15%. Adverse events were actually slightly higher in the um, control arm, and death was comparable at current follow-up. Efficacy is shown here. Uh, response rate was superior, 93 versus 81 percent for DRD. MRD negativity was superior, 24 versus 7 percent. And with a median follow-up of 28 months, PFS was also favoring DRD, where the median was not reached versus approximately 32 months. This translates into a hazard ratio of 0.56, or a 44 percent reduction in the risk of progression or death. The median overall survival in both arms is 17% uh, for DRD progression versus 21%. Again, hazard ratio favoring the addition of DARA, reassuring that we don't yet have a deterioration of the long-term outcomes by early use of these therapies. In terms of the efficacy in pre-specified subgroups, uh, again, pretty much across the board, we see an improvement with the addition of DARA. Phase, the ISS3 slightly crossing one, high risk again crossing one, but only about uh, 50 patients in both groups. Safety is shown here. We do know that CD38 is expressed on myeloid precursor cells, and so when you combine anti-CD38 therapies with IMIDs, we do see higher rates of neutropenia. All grades were, <coughs> excuse me, 57% uh, versus 42%, grade three and higher, 50 versus 35%. This also does result in a difference in lenalidomide dose intensity. Because of the additional neutropenia, there's more dose holds and modifications for len and you can see that 76% for DRD versus 91% for RD. And again, we do see the infection signal, 86% uh, all grades versus 73, uh, grade three and higher, 32 versus 23%. And typically, again, this is a respiratory issue. So how do we put this together for our transplant ineligible population? Um, I think the SWOG 77 study we often talk about was because even though RVD was our frontline regimen for almost a decade, this was the study, first phase three study done. But an important, and this was without the intent for transplant. However, I would caution from distinguishing that for transplant ineligible, because here the median age was only 63, which is the lowest of all four studies listed. The second column is RVD light, which is a phase two study. Alcyon and Maya, as we discussed, was 71 and 73. Median follow-up obviously differs. And then the depth of response is as indicated, um, with really impressive CR rates, uh, particularly with RVD light, 44%, um, the DARA VMP, 45%, and DARA RD, 49%. And the question is, how does this translate into survival endpoints with PFS? The SWAG had a hazard ratio of 0.71, with VMP, DARA VMP, 0.43, and DRD, 0.56. With, while this might suggest that DARA VMP is the superior regimen, it's important to remember again that this control arm did not get treatment to progression, and that would stack the odds in favor of experimental group. 
but I would just add at the bottom, there's differences in how bortezomib is given across these studies, and it's important to consider that when we're making a decision. So in SWAG, bortezomib was given twice weekly, um, which is quite difficult for transplant ineligible patients to tolerate, and it was given for six months. There was actually double of the discontinuation rate for toxicity in this study compared to RD. In RVD light, bortezomib was given primarily weekly for a total of 17 months, and in Alcyon, it was given for 12 months primarily weekly. So I think those are important considerations, and clearly DRD is another option. Um, ongoing studies that we're waiting data for, IMRAS, which is isatuximab RVD versus RVD, uh, is ongoing. Moving to the transplant eligible population, uh, this is the European study, Cassiopeia, which is VTD plus minus DARA. This is a very impressive large study, over 1,000 patients, median age of 58, as expected, good performance status and renal function, about 16% were high risk. The study design is DARA VTD induction. Uh, these are four cycles of 28 days, and uh, I'm going to keep bringing up that because I think this is an important distinguishing feature across the various studies that have looked at in this transplant eligible, but four cycles of induction with either DARA VTD or VTD. Uh, and also important in all the European studies, cyclophosphamide mobilization is used, unlike the American studies, where it's typically not. Uh, so it was three grams per meter squared mobilization for both arms, with two cycles of consolidation. And then the primary endpoint is after all of this induction, transplant, and consolidation, what is the stringent CR rate? So here we see the stringent CR rate was superior, 29% versus 20% with the addition of DARA, and that was statistically significant. We do see with additional therapy that those depths of response deepen. When we look at MRD negativity after transplant, 64% versus 44% by next-gen flow, 57 versus 37, again, favoring the triplet. Uh, we, surprisingly, uh, this is only with about a 19-month follow-up, already a PFS difference is observed with the DARA VTD showing superiority and a hazard ratio of 0.47, suggesting that this depth of response that we saw on the left is translating into survival benefit. In terms of efficacy subgroup analysis, um, pretty much we see, like with the previous studies, the addition of DARA favoring the triplet, or the quadruplet here, uh, the, the two groups of interest, uh, high risk ISS3, the hazard ratio again crossing one, and uh, high risk patients molecularly also crossing one, but small numbers, 80% uh, 80, 80 and then still favoring the addition of DARA. When we look at safety, uh, slight addition again for neutropenia, 28% grade three, four versus 15%. Um, the inf infections uh, were also slightly higher in this um, this arm. The induction discontinuation rate, uh, there was more discontinuation with the control arm um, and really not much difference in adverse events and a trend towards more deaths, uh, 2.6 versus 5.9. Moving to the Griffin, this is the U.S. study. This is a randomized phase two, so smaller patient size, approximately um, 100 in each arm. These are, uh, younger, again, young patients, good performance status, clearance greater than 30. Here we have 21-day cycles of four cycles of DARA RVD versus RVD, followed by uh, plerixifor mobilization, not cyclophosphamide, uh, followed by transplant, followed by two cycles of consolidation, DVRD versus RVD. And the primary endpoint, again, was after all of this induction, transplant, and consolidation, the stringent CR rate. Um, the median age here was 60, the ISS3, 14%, high risk, 15%. But importantly, you see in red, yeah, the rates of patients going to transplant was actually pretty different, 90% in the DVRD and uh, in RVD, 76%. I think highlighting the difficulty of doing randomized studies in the US where physicians don't always comply with the protocol. But um, in the Griffin, uh, the efficacy results are shown here. So again, the primary endpoint was that depth of response after consolidation. We see that's 42.4% in DVRD versus 32%. That was statistically significant. This odds ratio of 1.57 is actually comparable to what we saw in the Cassiopeia study. And this, the statistical language seems a little jargony, but basically this is a randomized phase two, and the uh, assumption was that DARA would not be inferior, so it's a one-sided p-value, and that was accepted at 0 0.1 uh, with an 80% power, and so this p-value of 0 0.068 did meet that cutoff and is statistically significant. The overall response rate also favored the addition of DARA, 99 versus 92%, and MRD negativity also 44 versus 14.6, so, although um, it's important to remember that there's a intention to treat analysis differs from the number of patients who actually got through transplant and had adequate samples, so a little bit different. And then this is the subgroup analysis. We look on the left with stringent CR uh, favoring the addition of DARA, 
uh, with, again, that straddling of for ISS3 and high risk across one, uh, with sample sizes very small here for randomized phase two, only about 14 patients in each arm for ISS3, and similarly for the high risk patients. For MRD negativity, we see that of the patients who got uh, testing, ISS3 patients did have a benefit from DARA RVD, and high risk patients did as well, um, so uh, favoring the quad. Safety is shown here, um, same story, more neutropenia with the addition of DARA, more infections, and at that, at that bottom it summarized the overall rates of infection, 82% versus 55%, but grade three, four were comparable, 17% in both arm. We are seeing a slight signal with the stem cell yield, um, 8.1 uh, times 10 to the 60 D34 collected for the DARA RVD versus 9.4, and there was more pleurixifor use, 70% versus 55%. And again, this is without cyclophosphamide use, although there were a few patients, approximately five in each arm. So to summarize, how do we put these together? Um, what is the addition of DARA giving us in 2019? Um, so I've included on here two other, I think, studies that are worth discussing in this context. First is the IFM 2009, which was RVD transplant versus uh, RVD without transplant, followed by the Forte study, which is KRD transplant versus KRD, and then the two studies that we just discussed. Uh, median follow-up, obviously, is, as indicated, uh, longer for the IFM. So first important difference is how much chemo are these patients getting? Because we can look at the primary endpoint of induction, transplant, consolidation, and what happens after all that. But you can see that there's tremendous heterogeneity in what's happening prior to transplant. So in, our, in the IFM 2009, there was only about 3.75 months of chemo versus the control arm six months. In Forte, there was eight, eight months of chemo versus 12 for the control arm. Casio PS6 and Griffin, four and a half. Next difference is mobilization. The European studies, uh, all on the left, the first three columns, all use psi mobilization. The US study did not. So in terms of the depth of response, we don't have all of the raw data, but when we look at the VGPR and better rates across the studies, we can see that there's a consistent improvement in the experimental arm. But uh, if we look at the experimental arm, 78% for RVD transplant, 89% for Forte, 83% for Cassiopeia, and 91% for Griffin. And so I think um, we need to keep in mind that these numbers are dependent on all the variables that we mentioned above, which is induction, chemo, duration, and also the mobilization. And the PFS, uh, we can see at the bottom, um, we know that the, the PFS has improved with the IFM study, which also the hazard ratio for OS was not yet met. It was not statistically significant, but the PFS was 50 months with the transplant versus 36. And Cassiopeia, as we mentioned, also significant. So I think what this tells us is that the addition of DARA is giving us deep responses. With Cassiopeia, that depth has already translated into PFS benefit, and it's gonna come down to what people wanna do, what's available in your country, uh, for those of you who are here from XUS, but um, suggesting that the addition of this DARA may be favorable. Ongoing studies to confirm this, Perseus is the DARA RVD versus RVD, and the German ESA RVD versus RVD. And finally, um, moving to the last topic of bispecifics, we're, we're a little data penic. Um, I think this slide summarizes the problem we have with high-risk data. These are just schematic outcomes. So in the upper left panel, obviously with conventional therapy, standard risk patients do better than high-risk patients. But there's three possible outcomes for novel therapy, and shown in the upper right panel is something that we have actually unfortunately seen in some myeloma studies, where the addition of, for example, thalidomide or venetoclax not only does it not help those high-risk patients, it actually hurts them, and you can see in the dotted blue line, these patients did worse. Moving to the lower left panel is what we usually see in these studies where the addition of novel therapies improves the outcomes of high-risk, so the dotted line for high-risk is better than dotted line for conventional therapy, but they're still not doing as well as the standard risk. The goal is the bottom right, which is high-risk and standard risk are no longer different. And as you've seen from the CD38 studies, we've made a lot of improvements in that lower left panel, but we still haven't overcome that. And I think that's an opportunity for novel therapeutics, including bispecifics. So this is just a schematic. Bispecifics, obviously, a uh, lot of talk about the BCMA, and um, these typically have the CD3 binding site in red and the blue, the BCMA binding sites. You can have a short half-life molecule, like on the left, AMG420. You can add a half-life extender, like AMG701, or you can have full antibodies with various structures, depending on the company. And the idea here is that these um, antibodies are going to activate T cells, form a cytolytic synapse, release cytokines and uh, granzymes and performant to result in apoptosis. This also highlights one of the other reasons to move forward with 
by specifics because we know that T-cell exhaustion is an increasing problem in patients going to CAR-T, and I think also we'll, we'll see the same story with bispecifics. So might it be better to use these before we've destroyed these patients' immune systems? Of course, we need to think about the safety as well. A lot of studies um, looking at bispecifics, many for BCMA. There's a GPRC, CD38, um, FC, FCRH5, so a lot of interest in this field. Um, but the, most, uh, the only really presented data we have is the same few patients we seem to talk about at every conference, but it's that AMG420, which is the short half-life molecule. This was with a median of four lines of prior therapy. They were refractory to only one prior therapy, so not a heavily treated patient. What's surprising is that there was a 70% response rate, which is more than we usually see in the, in the relapse refractory setting, whereas a single agent, we tend to see around 30% response rates. So this begs the question of how might this do in less uh, heavily treated patients? And the safety profiles, primarily CRS, low, low grades, and in infections, uh, and peripheral neuropathy, uh, again, with the short half-life molecule. So in conclusion, um, <clears throat> myeloma we haven't cured. Our initial therapy is probably our best chance to get a deep and durable response, especially for those frail elderly um, and high-risk patients. We haven't yet seen any, seen any deterioration of OS or PFS2 with the use of CD38 frontline. Um, MABs are usually well tolerated. We didn't discuss, which is beyond the scope of this, but the cost per unit efficacy gained, and I think that's an important question. Obviously, we are seeing increased infections, <clears throat> and we need to think about the mobilization strategy in these patients, and CS1 may be cautioned with the PIs, but awaiting more data. For the transplant ineligible patient, um, we really need to pay attention to the age of the patients. While SWOG is showing not only response, PFS, and OS benefit, it was a much younger median age, 63, and I would recommend RVD light for these patients instead of the SWOG regimen. But the PFS hazard ratios for DARA are very encouraging, 0 0.56, 0 0.43, in a truly older population. For the eligible population of transplant, it's really hard to compare these studies because of the variability of chemo and mobilization, but DARA plus VTD not only has increased response depth, but also translated into PFS with a short follow-up. We'll need that follow-up, obviously, for Griffin, and hopefully that'll come at ASH. We await data for newly diagnosed patients with anti-CS1 and other anti-CD38 antibodies. And finally, the bispecifics perhaps have a role for high-risk patients where we really need to do better. And with that, I'd just like to thank our team at Mount Sinai, and thank you for your attention.